I'm going to be talking about a number of things that primarily have to do with genetics, and all these things apply to, to aspects you can do in your practice today. None of this is experimental. All these things are clinically available. So in terms of disclosures, I'm the chief medical officer of a company called Celera. If you remember in 2001 when the human genome was decoded, uh, that was Celera. So there's a race between Francis Collins and this crazy guy named Craig Ventner to decode the human genome. So every day I get to work with some of the finest genetic scientists in the world. It's really exciting. And our whole thing is to discover genetic issues that have clinical practicality. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Involved with some universities and nonprofit things. In terms of my personal history, I spent, after my internship, residency, and fellowship, 10 years at Stanford University as director of the Lipid Research Clinic, and then went to the University of California, was spent 10 years there as director, became involved in the Human Genome Project, uh, worked a lot with American Heart, and went back to work in Atlanta for about the past eight years, and then about two years ago went to work to Aslera. So what you're going to hear is primarily based on National Institutes of Health research that's been known over about 30 plus years. So where, the way we think of atherosclerosis today is one question you have is, what's the person's risk? And you use Framingham and all kinds of things to determine that. Um, but have you thought about whether or not you should do something that actually detects the presence of the disease or not? So this is the issue of should you treat a laboratory number or should you treat the disease? And I'll address that as well. The second thing is, what's the etiology of the coronary disease in your patient? And what I'll show you is that elevated cholesterol is one of the least common causes of coronary disease, and there's a whole bunch of other factors. Then you can use this information to personalize treatment plans. So one of the problems I've had in my career, I've done lots and lots of large randomized clinical trials, and you've read a bunch of them, and the average value goes up or down, and so you apply that average value to your entire patient population. What you don't know, unless you actually look at the raw data, is there's a whole bunch of people in that study that did much better than average, and a whole bunch of people in that study that didn't do much of anything. So we talk about the average, but in reality, there's tremendous personal differences, and we'll talk about how to incorporate that. And finally, talk about families a little bit, <clears throat> and something you can do in your, your practice with families. So we decoded the human genome, and you can use genetics to do a number of things. You can uh, test hypotheses. Uh, you can uh, look at the pathophysiology of the disease, and uh, genetics discover new pathways. But over on the right is what I'm going to talk about. What can you do about personalizing therapy today using relatively simple genetic tests? So I'll be talking about tests that use single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, S-N-P. And here you remember the the DNA sequence, you have your nucleotide, cytosine, adenine, guanine, thymine, and you have the double helix there that Watson Crick got the Nobel Prize for. So these are all single nucleotides, cytosine, adenine, guanine, thymine. If you replace one of those, that's a difference or a polymorphism. And if you do just one, it's called a single nucleotide polymorphism. So this is relevant for a couple of reasons. Number one, you can see three potential people here. And on the top in white, those letters GCA, AGA, they're the three nucleotides that code for an amino acid from which you build proteins. And so you all remember this from back in medical school. And up on top there, you can see that first person. And the protein looks like that yellow rubber band to the right. Down below, the person has a single nucleotide polymorphism in the first three sequence. The GCA is now a GCG. So that single nucleotide was changed. However, it still codes for the amino acid alanine, and therefore the protein is not changed. So you can do single nucleotide polymorphism tests, and they have no consequence whatsoever on physiologic function. <clears throat> this is used by a lot of huge groups like National Geographic and the Human Genome Project and big GWAS consortiums to track different ethnic populations of the migration of human beings around the world, but it doesn't have medical impact. Down below, you can see in the second three letters, it says AAA, and that's different from AGA. That now codes for the amino acid lysine instead of arginine, and therefore the protein in the lower right corner is all squiggled up. So that enzyme might not work as well as it normally would, or it might work better than it would because of the single nucleotide polymorphism. So that's sort of by way of background. Scientists have isolated the gene that makes scientists want to isolate genes, and so, of course, that's why we do all this. 
But things are moving really, really fast. And uh, if, if I was in medical school today, I would definitely focus on this field because within the next five to ten years, there's going to be a revolution. We're, we're now doing whole genome sequencing all the time in our research studies. We can get that done about $1,500. Pretty soon that's going to be down to $100. And you're going to walk around with your patient's entire human genome on a thumb drive and use that to make decisions. And that will happen in our lifetime probably in the next five years. So here's something really interesting that happened in medicine. Years ago at the University of California, Berkeley, which is the head of the Human Genome Project, uh, we used what's called a candidate gene approach. And the candidate gene approach is um, I have a candidate gene, let's say it's a polymorphism in the enzyme lipoprotein lipase, and I think that's causing heart disease, and I'm going to prove that to you. So I'll get 10,000 people with that polymorphism, 10,000 people without it, and I'll show you that these people have a lot more heart disease. So my candidate gene is linked to heart disease. That approach to genetics has been a dismal failure. Almost nothing has been discovered in cancer or heart disease or anything. And you remember back, you know, 10 years or so ago where the interest in genetics started waning. And at about that time, we were doing research with single SNPs, or we used a really cool thing called the Roche Molecular Multistrip, and we could do 125 SNPs at one time, 125 at one time. So that was really cool. And a few months later, a company called Affymetrix comes out and says, well, we invented this thing called a gene chip and we can measure 100,000 of those at once, and then 500,000. And then we finished a research study in firefighters in Atlanta where we measured one million SNPs in every firefighter for $500 each. So now you have this incredible tool. You can look at, we now look at two million things all the time on somebody's genome with these, with these SNPs. And we say, gee, uh, the candidate gene approach failed. I have no hypothesis whatsoever about what causes heart disease. But I'm going to get 10,000 people with heart disease, 10,000 people without heart disease, do this million uh, SNP test on them, and see what pops up. And see what statistically pops up. So that's what's called GWAS, Genome-Wide Association Studies. And here's the first thing that was really discovered with that. Um, this is 9P21, and what you're looking at here is a Manhattan plot because it's supposed to look like the skyline of Manhattan. And here's your chromosomes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, going off to the right. And the height of the y-axis is the log of the p-value of how significant that thing is to the question you're asking. And in this case, the question was, does this group have heart disease? So here in chromosome 1, you can see a whole series of Assume there are just 100 lines here. And, you know, they have different heights. And so that's, you know, that's a little significant, but not terribly. You come over here and, wow, this thing is like the Empire State Building. It's huge. That's how it was discovered. It was discovered serendipitously, and it's in a non-coding region of your genome. So about 4% of your genome makes up proteins and things we know about. About 96% we used to call junk DNA, meaning it's just there for filler. You can cut it out and throw it away. It's probably not going to affect you at all. We now know that those are all regulatory regions. So we know now that this 9P21 regulates inflammatory aspects that I'll tell you about in just a second. But it was discovered and first published in, in 2007 by Bob Roberts and his group in Ottawa and the DECODE group, and this is the way it was discovered. So the way you can use this is you can say, okay, I have a population of a bunch of people, and I'm going to give them all a low-fat diet or give them all a statin or whatever. But in reality, I can do a gene test and say, okay, uh, there's one group of people in which that therapy works really, really well. The standard therapy is good. There's another group in which it does crap, but it doesn't do anything. Therefore, I need a second therapy. So one way to use this is pharmacotherapeutics, and I'll mention that a little bit as well. So the risk factors for coronary disease you know about, smoking, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, genetics is equally important. And do people recognize this guy? Remember how long he lived? I think he was like 97 or 98 years old when he died. Um, so the randomized clinical trials tell you how the average person would respond. None of your patients are average. So to set the stage for the next few slides, I want to refresh your memory which about a, uh, three concepts that I know you're familiar with. The first is relative risk reduction, and this is what you read about all the time in the New England Journal of Medicine or you hear about with statin commercials on TV where there's a 25% risk reduction. They leave out the word relative. Therefore, you should use my drug or my diet in everybody because of this 25% relative risk reduction. So if you have 1,000 people in the treatment group, 1,000 people in the placebo group, you have 100 heart attacks in the placebo group, you have 75 heart attacks in the drug group, that's a 25% relative risk reduction. It could be 
four heart attacks in the, in the drug group, three, uh, four heart attacks in the placebo group, three heart attacks in the drug group, and it's still a 25% relative risk reduction. It's not 25% of a thousand people, and the public doesn't know this. So um, I <clears throat> review, and I'm on the editorial board for 36 different journals, and now most of them have made the decision that we're going to uh, ask the authors to report um, absolute risk reductions, which is the absolute difference. So if you take those numbers I gave you in the upper paragraph with relative risk, it turns out the absolute risk reduction is 1%. And in fact, we have a number of publications, and most recently in circulation, looking at all these studies, and the 25 to 27% relative risk reduction you see in all the stat studies is on average 3% absolute risk reduction. Now, that's a big problem for me because, and I've done some of the, the seminal uh, clinical trials in terms of cholesterol reduction and heart disease, and I know there's a whole bunch of people getting their LDL cholesterols down and still having heart attacks. So I think it's a disservice to let people think that, and there's things you can do. <clears throat> so one of the things is, uh, can we enhance the Framingham study? Well, we know the Framingham study doesn't identify a lot of people for a number of reasons. This is just looking at non-invasive imaging, and 69% had non-invasive imaging like a CT scan evidence of clinical disease, only 23% of those would have been high risk by the Framingham risk score. So from a number of aspects, you can say we have to do a whole lot better than Framingham, and is there anything uh, that might help us? And that has to do with a concept called risk reclassification. And you can do this with a number of issues now, but it's important because of this slide. You're looking at Framingham data, and you're looking at total blood cholesterols on the bottom here. Here's 200, there's 300. You're looking at HDL cholesterol on the y-axis. There's 20, there's 40, there's 60. And there's two ovoids here. The solid ovoid are people that get coronary disease. The hatched mark ovoid are people that do not. So nobody's lying to you. It's absolutely true that the average person with heart disease has higher total and LDL cholesterol and lower HDL cholesterol. It's statistically significant, which means it probably didn't happen due to chance. 